All right. Well, good evening and, and welcome to our preview of Rio Grande Steam Finale, which is our latest book. My name is Haley Page, the Exhibition and Events Manager at the Center for Rio Photography and Art. And thank you, as always, for joining us tonight. This evening, we're going to be hearing from the book's editors, Scott Lotus and L. Ron Lawrence, and I'll be introducing them in just a moment. Um, as a reminder, we are recording tonight's presentation, and it will be made available on our YouTube channel in about two weeks' time. You can see that in all of our past presentations at youtube.com slash railphotoart, and I can, I'll can i be sharing that link in the chat a little bit later. Um, and just a reminder that these programs are all totally free. Um, they are made possible by membership and donations from our community, so thank you as always for helping us continue to bring all of this stuff to you. Um, just as some quick housekeeping, uh, we do use Zoom webinar for presentations. That means audiences don't have access to their um, audio or video during the presentation, um, but you can change how you view your screen up in that top right corner under the icon view. At the bottom of your screen, you'll see a number of other icons. Use that chat uh, button for any comments you have during the presentation. And by selecting everyone, you'll ensure that all the audience can see your comments and use that Q&A uh, to submit any questions you have during the presentation. Following um, our main presentation, we will be hosting a Q&A session. If you have a question at any point during the presentation, make sure you post that in the Q&A, not the chat, to make sure that we see it. So our presenters tonight will say a little bit more about the center and um, all of our programs. So let me bring them up to the stage in, um, in just a moment. So Scott Lotus has been the center's ex executive director since 2011 and editor of our journal, Railroad Heritage, since 2013. His photographs and articles appear frequently in magazines such as, such as Trains, Classic Trains, and Rail Fan and Railroad, and this is his fourth book that he has edited or co-edited. And then Elron Lawrence joined the center in 2022 as our acquisitions and marketing coordinator. His love for railroads and vintage highways led him to write the book, Route 66 Railway, and his work has appeared in a wide range of magazines news and corporate publications, books, and advertising. And I'll keep it short so we can get to the good stuff. So I'll bring these guys up to the stage now. All right. Well, thanks, Haley. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Haley. And thanks, everyone, for joining us tonight. It's always great to yeah. see so many numbers and all of the locations and weather reports and everything else come in on the chat. That's always a lot of fun for us. So give me one moment. I'm going to share my screen. And then... I think we can take it away. Does that look good on your end, Al? Looks good to me. I All see right. everything. Well, again, good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's program, an online launch of our new book, uh, Rio Grande Steam Finale, Narrow Gauge Railroad Photography in Colorado and New Mexico. As Haley said, I'm Scott Lotus, president of the center and editor of the book. I'm joined tonight by Elrond, our acquisitions and marketing coordinator and co-editor of the book. And before we get started with our presentation, we would like to say just a few words about the Center for anyone who's joining us for the first time, or as a refresher, if you already know us well. Um, we like to say a lot at the Center that railroads and photography are you know, these two mechanical technologies that really came of age together in the 19th century and both really shaped tremendously how we experience the world. And railroad photography remains quite popular to this day. Uh, as this great photograph from Victor Hand attests, this shows close to 50 different photographers, as well as a few train crew members on the Cumbres and Toltec Scenic Railroad for a photo special in 1980. Uh, that's Victor down there at lower left holding one of his trademark speed graphics. I think, I think he had another one up on a tripod and a timer for this shot. Um, if any of you out there uh, were there for this and recognize yourself, we would absolutely love to know uh, who you are and where you are in this photograph. So uh, please uh, give us a shout about that. We'd, uh, we'd just really mm -hmm. love to, to hear about that. Um, and we just really love this photograph as it shows the great popularity of, and the enduring appeal of the narrow gauge. Um, now, this was at this point 43 years ago, uh, but just two days ago, I was in Pennsylvania and fortunate enough to chase Reading and Northern's at 2102, and there were easily another 50 photographers out chasing it, as well as, I think, close to a sold-out crowd on board uh, of several hundred. And I found it extremely encouraging that I was among the older photographers who was there chasing it. I saw lots of people in their 20s and 30s out taking still photographs and 
filming some of them using a very high end video equipment and and, uh, and tri tripods that are uh, far out of my league so that was really great to see and i think just continues to speak to the appeal of, of steam and all of its shapes and sizes uh, getting back to the center though you know there are hundreds of different railroads uh, museums and societies out there but um, we do have kind of a, a unique focus here at the center i think we're really the only one that has this exclusive focus on the visual culture of railroading and we also have a, a pretty unique business model and elrond is going to tell you a little bit more about that mm -hmm. yeah and i should say while scott's changing the image uh, we we did indeed have a co-editor's hat roll tonight so we're going to try to shake it up next time but we decided to have the decided to have a uniform look tonight <laughs> Uh, so as Scott mentioned, we don't have a museum or gallery space of our own. We have a business office and an archival storage facility, both located in Madison. From these, we maintain a growing collection of more than half a million, half a million images with another half a million promise to us that provide much of the material for everything we do. And so right now we're especially excited about Odyssey, our new online collections management system that we've implemented this year. Uh, came to life in June, and I hope everyone has at least taken a look and uh, browsed through it, uh, because our collections team has already populated it with just about 12,000 images now, and we have more coming online every week. So please visit and visit often. Yeah, and there are many Narragage photographs to be found on there, too, from Colorado, New Mexico, and many other parts of the world. Right, all the ones that didn't make in the book. So <laughs> Some of them, at least. <laughs> Lots of them. <laughs> we have quite a few in the book. We did. Right. We did. <laughs> uh, our other main initiatives include preparing traveling exhibitions that go to museums and galleries all around the country. Um, those currently include BB and Clay, their enduring photographic legacy, which is at the Colorado Railroad Museum in Golden through the end of the year. And there are several others uh, making the rounds around the country as well. Uh, let's see. In fact, just last month, we opened a new staging of Milwaukee's beer line. In, in Milwaukee at the brand new connector building on the Beer Line Trail. Uh, and this will be there through next summer. You can find out more about all of our traveling exhibitions on our website. Just go to railphoto-art.org and click exhibits. We also host conferences, events, and presentations, including online presentations like this. Uh, but what you're seeing in this picture is our 2023 conference at Lake Forest College, north of Chicago. Um, we also make annual awards for creative imagery, and I think you've probably heard about that. We just announced the winners of our contest and hosted them in a recent online event. Uh, we also publish a quarterly journal called Railroad Heritage. Each issue is 68 pages, ad-free, as we marketing folks like to say, and it's mailed out to all our members. And it is a beautiful magazine, and the gentleman above me or beside me is the editor, and uh, we are all very proud to have this uh, represent the center and get out there into the world. We're very fond of, excited by each new issue. Um, we're a nonprofit organization. We're funded primarily by you, our community of members. Your support makes up about 70% of our annual income. So you truly empower everything we do, and we cannot thank you enough. Here, here. And this is most of our board of uh, directors and our staff at a meeting just before our conference this spring at Lake Forest. Our board is tremendous. They are all volunteers. They come from all over the country and they bring to us a wide range of experience and expertise from all different fields. They've helped us build a staff of talented and dedicated professionals that now numbers nine. And you can see several of them here in this picture, including a few familiar faces. If you are already a member, thank you. And if you're not, we encourage you to check out our website. Uh, click railphoto uh, dot, sorry, dash art dot org. You can also follow us in social media. I am generally the manager of all of our social media platforms, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. I will not say the X. Uh, we <laughs> also are on, <laughs> we are also on threads. But um, you can also watch our online presentations on our YouTube channel. Uh, click youtube.com and go to Rail Photo Art, and that's where you'll find us. And, and just for uh, everyone's benefit, Elle's doing a tremendous job with our social media, and I think we're having pretty much daily posts on our, our main platforms of Facebook and Instagram right now. So 
there's always more content coming out and we put a lot of our announcements and news out there too. Yeah, yeah, please follow us if you can. It's very entertaining and we it's a fun way for us to share uh, the photos from our collection that we may not be able to fit into an issue of Rail Heritage and there's not enough books. And so this is a great way to see many of the images in our collection. But we're here to talk about books tonight, uh, specifically our new one. Um, but we wanted to start by kind of looking at, at you know, where our publishing program has come from. Um, we've been publishing a, a book roughly every year for the past several years. Uh, we've paired some of these books up with our exhibitions, uh, like After Promontory, the B.B. and Clegg exhibit, uh, Railroaders, Jack Delano's Homefront Photography. Those were all, you know, essentially expanded catalogs for our traveling exhibitions. And then others of our books have presented photography from, from one of our collections. And when we were a smaller organization and had fewer collections, we started by publishing monographs about the work of individual photographers. But one thing we've realized as our collections have grown is that you know, with now over, uh, I think, uh, more than 100 discrete uh, artists and photographers represented in our archive, it's just not going to be possible to, to publish a monograph about each one, much as we might like to. So we've really begun looking for, for more ways to showcase uh, images from several of our collections in the same book. Now, with all the material that we have, uh, finding the right bit of overlap to do that can, can be a bit of a challenge. And so in the case of our, our next book, as you may have guessed, what we had to do was actually narrow our focus my um, good pun for the the well gauge rails that we all love and and this iconic image from richard steinheimer that was the cover for his landmark book backwoods railroads of the west um and that was a common threat that we found in so many of our largest collections the those two steel rails running three feet apart of the rio grande narrow gauge uh, jim shaughnessy richard steinheimer fred springer victor hand tom gildersleeve john gruber all of them traveled from far and wide to shoot that final decade of freight service on the narrow gauge and they shot it extensively um, and this was kind of a challenge even for this book we thought oh we narrowed it down we found this perfect focus and then we looked and we have five thousand photographs of the rio grande narrow gauge in our archive uh, more than two thousand by john gruber alone and all of them shot it incredibly well i mean they captured not just this particular railroad but really an entire way of, of steam railroading, uh, in many ways iconic of the American West. Um, and now, of course, they were not alone in their fascination with this singular operation. In the great pantheon of railroad publications, perhaps no subject has been documented in such great disproportion to its size than the Rio Grande Narrow Gauge. A vast trove of fantastic books already exists, but we thought there might be room for one more. And I, I should point out that, that even our title is not original. Uh, a book by Lloyd Stagner uh, that looked at both the standard gauge and the narrow gauge had the title of, of Rio Grande Steam Finale. Uh, fortunately, the publisher of that, Jim Rystor, is a good friend of ours and, and was happy to, to let us run with that title in, in this book. So as we said, we call our book Rio Grande Steam Finale with the subtitle to differentiate it. Uh, narrow gauge railroad photography in Colorado and New Mexico. And that is a Victor Hand photograph on the cover. It features a Cumbria's turn climbing uh, up to the summit at Windy Point in 1967. Now, to the best of my knowledge, uh, while there's been dozens of books already published about the narrow gauge, this will be the first big hardcover photography book uh, about the narrow gauge. And I think the first to assemble the work of so many of that era's great photographers. Uh, Elrond joined me as co-editor on this project, and as you'll see later, both his eyes and his enthusiasm were just crucial to getting us over the finish line. Now, going through the thousands of images in our collections, we were both struck by how each one of these photographers brought their own signature style to the narrow gauge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, at, I, I think there's no way to assess the the style of a photographer than seeing hundreds of their images and having to sort through them all I and mean, their styles readily become apparent. And uh, Victor Hand, I mean, he has that awesome cover shot, but also he has this, this big sweeping landscape view. And we saw several of these from Victor working with his four by, four by five speed graphic. Uh, this is a westward freight west of Antonito in October of 1967. And then there's Jim Shaughnessy, who walked and shot with a two and a quarter, uh, two, uh, two and a quarter square format camera 
uh, use type framing to create intimate views. And you can see this shop scene of Alamosa in 1957. And then there's Dick Steinheimer, who frequently shot directly into the sun for drama and contrast and to emphasize that incredibly clear light of the high country. And this is one of one of my all time favorite views. Of course, there's a lot of those favorite views of number 478 switching a brakeman on the top of a boxcar in Durango uh, back in January of 1961. And then while most of these photographers went after the freight trains, Fred Springer rode many of the fan trips of the 50s and 60s. This is a Rocky Mountain Railroad Club excursion preparing to depart from Alamosa in May of 1960. And how cool is that? I'm sure Dave Schaff is already eyeing this to use in his Rocky Mountain Railroad Club newsletter and Facebook group. Uh, really, just yeah, a, we a bunch. Of, we have bunches of photographs of Fred's from several of these trips. So yeah, we should yeah. we should hook Dave up with those. Yeah, we definitely should. Yeah, but such a great slice of life of uh, the rail fanning world. And look at these guys in ties climbing aboard cars. I mean, there's a guy setting up his tripod with a suit and tie. Definitely a different time. Uh, so at a time when black and white dominated railroad photography, Tom Gildersleeve shot extensively in color. And I'm not surprised because as I know Tom, he is quite the rebel. And uh, I'm sure he's smiling right now, or at least I hope he's smiling as he's watching. But uh, Tom kind of broke the mold and went for color and gave us a lot of really spectacular color images that we just wouldn't have had otherwise. Uh, this is the Cumbries Turn east at, is it Coxo? I never did get that pronunciation right. Um, in 1962. And uh, yeah, we were just so grateful that uh, Tom and a few of the other uh, very rare uh, breed of color photographers were there to, you know, give us that, that uh, view of what it was like where, you know, my wife and I have a running joke about how the world was black and white before 1939. And so uh, it's nice to see these images, and you know, to show us uh, what everyone was seeing as well as, you know, what we're seeing looking back. Uh, and then there's our founder, John Gruber, who brought his signature photojournalism to the narrow gauge to portray its people. And in this case, uh, use, he's, there's a crewman using a journal jack to fix a hot box at Sublet in August of 1967. But I mean, John is really the glue that puts so much of this project together. Um, his photography, just looking at his, at the way he approached the narrow gauge as a story, not just showing the trains, but showing the people, the line side character, all the little small town details, the stations, the stops, I mean, just the moods that he brought to it. Uh, his photography really helped convince us that we can make this book. And it, it's absolutely the glue that, that brings it all together. And, uh, you yeah, know, this is a shot that's not in the book, but you know, there's a few pretty stunning shots that have the same vibe of where you are just a, a fly on the wall, you know, crawling around with the crews and seeing everything up and close, down and dirty. It's just, it's such a testament to him. And I'm sure a lot of you remember his Landmark Trains article, um, and, and which I, I pulled out and uh, just kind of quietly drooled over as we were getting <laughs> this book together. And uh, we wanted to do honor to the feeling that he gave us in that in that magazine. But you know, with all this great work, finding the, the right narrative to weave it all together took some searching. And what we landed on was essentially to follow the normal operations of the era uh, by following a, a freight train from Alamosa all the way up to the end of the line at Farmington and then back again, uh, divided up by each uh, typical day of operation uh, along with a side trip up the Silverton branch. Uh, this map appears in the book's front end papers, and it is the spectacular work of our good friend David Stiefy, uh, along with a grade profile, too. Um, some people have said that it's, it's worth the price of the book by itself, and Dave really did a bang-up job on this, and we're, we're proud to have it here. Mm. Uh, we also have two essays in the book, and we reached out to two authors who experienced the narrow gauge firsthand and have committed their photography to our archive, uh, Don Hofsommer and Carl Zimmerman. Uh, uh, most of us might really know Don first as a historian, uh, but he turned in a highly entertaining first-person essay about how he caught the narrow gauge fever in his young years. Uh, it's paired with his own photography, which is outstanding. Uh, this is his night shot at Alamosa after a train had arrived from the West in the summer of 1964. 
Uh, he and his uh, new wife at the time, Sandy, had married at the end of the school year uh, that spring, and then they spent that summer doing graduate work at Alamosa State College in Alamosa. Uh, I'm sorry, Adams State College in Alamosa, uh, that location chosen for its proximity to the narrow gauge. Uh, and then Carl's essay really ties it all together at the end, um, speaking from the pain of loss. Uh, and that was particularly poignant for him. Uh, while he had some luck on his first two trips to the narrow gauge, uh, like catching this Farmington turn at Aztec in 1967, he and his wife Laurel spent three weeks out there in August of 1968, and not a single freight train ran the whole time they were there. And then uh, the very last revenue freights ran just a few days after they had left, uh, something Carl's never really fully gotten over, uh, but he shares that story beautifully uh, in his closing essay at the end of the book. Mm -hmm. And and his essay really sets us up for that final chapter of the book, because one of the things we realized is we can't tell the complete story without saying what's happening today. I mean, there's such a, a you know a huge popular following of the railroads that you know that fill that legacy, that carry on that legacy, uh, the Cumbries and Toltec and and the uh, Durango and Silverton. And you know the bottom line is we didn't lose this railroad in a lot of ways you know we we kept some really wonderful pieces alive and so we conclude with a gallery of more recent photographs and an afterward by rich tower who's on our board and also acted with the friends of the cumbries and toltec and it, it's a really wonderful uh essay that sends us off with excitement and a and a you know a, definitely a hunger to go out and go shoot the next fan trip or ride the next train uh but this is the chapter where we show how the narrow gauge has adapted how it's endured, and how the photography of it has changed. Uh, this section includes photographs by Rick Malo, shown here on a, uh, one of his photos is here on a train west of Antonito in the fall of 2022, uh, as well as photos by Bill Botkin, Jeff Mass, Justin Franz, a uh, couple for me, and both Nick and Anthony D'Amato. And it's, it's a great chapter too, but again, well, it actually sets me up for our next photo or our next slide because that has to do with editing. <laughs> and if, you know, as, as I, I did a book before Route 66 Railway and if everyone would ask me, what's the toughest part? And it's always the editing. It's always mm -hmm. cutting the images. And that was indeed our greatest challenge for this book. Scott did such a great job diving into the thousands of images that his first edit was just an embarrassment of riches. I mean, he basically sent me a, a gigantic PowerPoint that had the rough spreads of the book. And when he enlisted me to help and sent me this giant work back in December, he said, we needed to cut about 20 page spreads. Well, that translates to cutting about 40 pages and they're all filled with photos by my heroes. So <laughs> we tackled that job, but oh, it's tough. Um, in doing so, we have to consider pacing, making sure our various chapters have equal coverage as best as we could, and eliminating images that weren't as strong as others, or, or images that had a similar look and feel to other images that maybe were a little stronger. Uh, in most cases, we would cut entire page spreads, but in some cases, there were images we couldn't live, live without, and so we got a little more clever. Um, here's one of those spreads from the West to Chama chapter where I cut the Gruber image at left, but kept Stein's classic reflection shot. If you go to the next slide, you'll see another spread that we had to make some cuts in. And so we kept the uh, image at left, cut the image at right to create the final spread that you see in this final slide. And this is how it ended up in the book, obviously with captions. Uh, this happened again in an even more difficult cut in the West to Chama chapter we took this beautiful Gruber panorama and we just we just did not have the space and to run it on two full pages. Um, but we were also struggling with a similar spread by Gruber, what a surprise, with crew uh, doing their work on the train and then this awesome view from the cab at Sublet. And again, we combined the Sublet cab view with the panorama into the final spread you see in this slide. And this is how it ended up in the book. Uh, one last chap well, one last example from the Alamosa chapter. We cut a Gruber image on the right and moved this beautiful Stein portrait of 483 and other power, including a Rio Grande GP9, in its place, and then brought in an, another awesome Gruber shot of engineer Johnny Lira that you see over to the left. 
And in doing so, we kind of had a happy accident. We sort of stumbled onto a page spread where you feel like you're walking around the locomotives and the Stein image just gives you a great final scene for the chapter. And so that was our editing dilemma, which we encountered over and over and over, but it's, it's a good problem to have, but boy, it's tough. It was such a, a, a brief and painless synopsis of, of what was really a gut-wrenching process and for several days and weeks for the two of us. Yeah, I'm, I'm softballing here. It was <laughs> agony. Especially when we cut an image and I look back and it's Shaughnessy. Right. Or it's Steinheimer. Like, yeah, who, who are we to even do this? But somebody yeah, has... who are we? We're not worthy. <laughs> so... After talking about that a little bit, I thought what we'd do now is just kind of run through the, the book's organization. And uh, most of these photographs are actually not ones that are in the book, but they still kind of capture the spirit of, of how we laid it out. And it's a great way to, to showcase a, a few more of these great photographs and give them at least a few moments to shine here tonight. Um, so, you know, we start in Alamosa. We follow a train all the way west to Farmington and come back. And so we start here with this uh, this great uh, Don Hofsommer view of that just beautifully complex maze of three rail trackage at the, the yard in Alamosa. Um, and, you know, we start uh, kind of with uh, the preparations of the crews at work in the shops and the roundhouse getting the locomotives ready for a, a day's work. This is a, a Jim Shaughnessy photograph uh, looking down the boiler of one engine at the 487 out there on the turntable in preparation for its uh, trip west that day. This is in uh, 1959. And this is a scene that greeted John Gruber when he arrived at Alamosa to do his epic uh, two-day trip uh, aboard the train for his article in Trains Magazine. Um, and we love this one too, but that that you know, Steinheim review with the low angle and the, the really that kind of heroic stance of the locomotive you know, up above you was really the one that we wanted to, to use here, much as we would have loved to use both. Um, and then just this fantastic uh, a worker shot by Victor Hand uh, of... Uh, the crew getting their train ready here in Alamo. So this is uh, August 28th, 1968. And that's uh, the very last revenue freight train preparing to depart from Alamo. So that day. On the pain scale, this was about a nine plus to cut. Well, yeah, yeah, no, you know, no book would be the same if you did it twice. And certainly if we did this book twice, there'd be a real strong chance that this one would be in it and something else would not. But that's just <laughs> the way these things go sometimes. Right, right. Right, I see in the chat, volume two, the outtakes. Yeah. <laughs> oh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, finally, uh, we get uh, we get the train uh, out of out of Alamosa. And, you know, it, we were, Elva and I were talking this afternoon about how, you know, we get the photographs and it's early morning light and the light's beautiful and they're getting the engines ready and thinking about that all day run. And then it just seemed like it would take forever to get the train out of Alamosa. It was often close to noon by the judging from the, the harsh light and, and shadows by the time the train actually left. And I can going through the photographs, I could as a photographer myself, I could just sort of feel my my heart and tension rising as as the day gets later and later. Uh, and and so much like uh, the trains themselves, we eventually had to get the book out of Alamosa and, and on the road. Uh, and so. We do that. Uh, US 285 follows the narrow gauge for its first, uh, well, three rail trackage for its first 29 miles uh, south to Antonito. And uh, that's a great uh, view of, by Victor Hand of a double header with some big pipe loads behind the power and a, a great uh, car from the era out there on 285. Mm -hmm. And there were just so many great shots from this stretch because access was easy with the road right there. And so many photographers started their encounters with the narrow gauge in Alamosa. And, and chase the train out of there. Um, Jim Shaughnessy has this fantastic view of a double header under the you know, big characteristic Colorado thunderheads boiling down off the San Juans and into the San Luis Valley here. And I just love this low angle view of, of this double header uh, charging to meet that, that great big Colorado sky. And then something that everybody did uh, was to pace these trains and then take pacing photographs from from uh, 285, and, and this is Shaughnessy's view of the 484 and the 488 racing south with those, the more of those just beautiful big clouds boiling up above. But El, I think we we both agreed that no matter how many dramatic sky photographs we had in the archive, we could still only fit so many of them into the book. <laughs> exactly. Sometimes your eyes kind of glaze over. Yeah. I mean, just by the beauty of these skies alone, yeah. uh, you Colorado folks have it, have it really made with your with your panoramas, man. And you know, it was interesting to watch kind of the train's slow progress. I mean, this was kind of the fastest part of the railroad where the engines could maybe run 30 miles an hour and yet, you know, they 
have to stop and take water in Lahara, and then they'd have to stop in Antonito to pull up and move the helper engine to the middle of the train. And so that's what we have in this uh, Steinheimer picture from 1961. I think the crew's actually taken a lunch break there and heading back out to their engines uh, after that to probably move the 483 back to mid-train service and head into the mountains beyond. And of course, we all know that famous sign uh, just west of Antonito where it says the end of standard gauge. And uh, this is a Fred Springer photograph of it from 1960. And I love this because you can actually see the, the where the third rail ends, uh, not more than a few hundred feet beyond this sign. So, uh, boy, if you were still moving at any rate at all and you passed this, you'd probably be diving into the sagebrush at this point. Huh? Probably some of the, the Rio Grande guys could share stories about whether any standard gauge cars ever went off the tracks there. But uh, it's just yeah. such a such a stark <laughs> end, and then it's just those two three foot rails stretching to the horizon. Yeah, that sign doesn't give you a whole lot of warning <laughs> no. if you weren't paying attention up till now. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, access got a lot more difficult after that. As anyone who's ridden the Cumbers and Toltec would know, uh, there weren't very many roads; they weren't very good. Uh, but Don Hofsommer, that summer that he was out there, he found some ways to to get up the the grade going west and. Uh, he and his wife Sandy would often take their textbooks when they knew a train was running and they'd drive up to one of their favorite uh, lookout points up around Sublette and, and wait for the train to show up, um, studying for their, their next day's uh, lectures and uh, hoping that some of those uh, voracious Colorado thunderstorms didn't blow them off the mountain. This is Don's great photo of a, a double, uh, you know, two engine train sweeping around one of those great big uh, curves as they loop up the, up the grade um, uh, coming towards Sublette. And uh, as we already showed, John Gruber got some great photographs there of the train doing servicing on the, that time he rode. Uh, and this is uh, Fireman uh, Gail Cunningham uh, watering his engine, the 493, here during their stop. And that's also where they had to, to make, the, I think, their final repair to the hot box they discovered on one of their pipe cars on this train. I think uh, John's notes said they stopped three or four different times to deal with this. And I guess at the section house at Sublette, they they had the tools they needed, including this uh, journal jack that was uh, made in uh, uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania by the Duff Norton Manufacturing Company. Um, this was a, a great opportunity for me to learn a little bit more about this aspect of railroading through John's photography. And I love this close up view that really shows clearly. I mean, this is, you know, the freight car equivalent of the, the spare tire jack in the trunk of your car. And you know, here they're, they're jacking up their axle to be able to, to rebrass the bearing and continue on their way. And again, it's just this great photojournalistic storytelling that John does through his really up close black and white photography. Another way that people got access to this remote stretch was the photo run bys on some of the fan trips. And while we primarily used freight train photographs in the book, we did include a few of Fred Springer, uh, Fred Springer and Victor Hand's great views of some of the excursions that were still pretty common on the, on the Rio Grande Mirror gauge at the time. Now, this is another Rocky Mountain Railroad Club fan trip behind the 476. Uh, coming out of Rock Tunnel into the Toltec Gorge in May of 1958. Yeah, it's such a furious shot. I mean, and you know, you set it up so well earlier with that group photo in the beginning where everything <laughs> is so calm and everyone's happy. And now you just see, now you just see, you know, fire and brimstone, man. Oh, um, the sound must be tremendous as those engines wow. storming out of the tunnel there. Yeah, yeah. And then, you know, as we were talking earlier about those late departures from Alamosa, as, as so often happened by the time the train got up to where the road rejoined it up around those pinos and those big sweeping horseshoe curves, the sun had already set. And that was that was the case for John Gruber on this day in October 1962. But using the, the great tonal range and low light capabilities of black and white film, he kept shooting right away and got this really nice moody view of a, a train sweeping around the curve there and about to, to pull up by the water tank. Yeah, you and know, of course, he, there's that that harrowing descent down the four percent grade uh, into Chama, where the the train crews would tie up, and uh, Carl Zimmerman was there on a, a beautiful August afternoon in 1967 when the train came down the hill uh, before sunset, and some of the local boys came out to to greet the crew as they uh, pulled in and and uh, put their train away for the night. Mm -hmm. Hey, Scott, I see a comment from Dave Chef that I guess in that last panoramic view, there's a lot of homes visible in that scene now. Yeah, there's something, that, true. something yeah. we didn't, yeah, that I'm no. sure we'll have a, we'll have a little just, culture shock when we come back. When we no, come back thanks for that comment, know. Dave. It's a great reminder of, of the importance of photography to capture things before they change. Uh, and certainly parts of 
the railroad look very much the same today and parts of them are incredibly different and we have great photographs to show what it was mm -hmm. Uh, so this would have been the first day of a, a narrow gauge uh, freight train cycle uh, with one train coming west from Alamosa into Chama. It would actually need a train that came east from Durango to Chama, but we do that in the, later in the in the return trip. And so we continue following uh, a train west. We'd have a different crew on it the second day as the, the crews went back to their home terminals from Chama. And so we have this, uh, uh, this great uh, Fred Springer photograph of a little train in the big landscape. Uh, this would be the the 486 and the 480 uh, steaming west from Chama and the open country there in July of 1961. This is on part of the line that's that's abandoned and uh, pretty much completely gone at this point. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, while most of the book is black and white, Al already mentioned a Victor Hand or a Tom Gildersleeve's color work, and Victor Hand gave us a little bit as well, a shooting color yeah. negative film in his four by five. And this is uh, another photograph of his of the. The very last uh, freight train west out of Chama on August 29th, 1968, uh, with the 483 uh, taking a long cut of the boxcars, I think, hauling uh, some drilling mud out to the out to the oil fields of Farmington one last time. Yeah, we were talking about this earlier today, and I I just love this image so much. It's I'm a big fan of of 1960s movies where they went you know really big with 70 millimeter and Panavision, and I mean this feels like it's a frame just ripped right out of a right out of a movie. It's just yeah. so cinematic. No, and the, the detail in Victor's four by fives is just really something to behold. And it's uh, it's great to be able to to print some yeah. of his photographs pretty big in the book, including a couple of two page spreads of, of his work there, which is well deserved. Mm -hmm. And then of course we had to get a, a caboose shot in here and there as we could. This is a Fred Springer view of uh, a train uh, west of Willow Creek, New Mexico in uh, 1961 with the uh, 0505 caboose bringing up the rear there ahead of a water car. And so after this this run across the sort of the the high uh, the high rangelands, uh, the trains uh, eventually arrive in Durango, and Fred Springer gives us this great view of the facilities there as they existed in 1958 during that Rocky Mountain Railroad Club trip he was on, which explains all the people milling about the yards there. Um, and of course, another scene that's changed tremendously, um, you know, in the in the time past, and actually not too long after after. Uh, this photograph was taken, I think, by by the end of the 1960s, uh, Durango was starting to look a lot different. And so we spent a little bit of time exploring Durango in the book, um, since that was you know, the, really the railroad's base of operations out there on its western end. Uh, this is a Tom Gildersleeve color view of a, of a Farmington turn getting ready to pull out of Durango. Uh, and you know they would pick up most of their cars out of Carbon Junction. Uh, but Tom got this great view of the train leaving with just a few cars passing the depot that day. And then, you know, there was just such a, a plethora of great night photography from Durango, uh, particularly by Richard Steinheimer, but by others as well. But this this Steinheimer view of, of this, the contrasting images of the, the hot 494 here in the foreground and the ice cold 486 with snow piled up on top of it in the background there of uh, January of 1961 is uh, really, really a striking scene and uh, emblematic of so much of the great night photography that was made there. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then, as I mentioned, the the trains uh, would normally the the westbound train would would drop off most of its cars for Farmington out at Carbon Junction, and then when the Farmington train came out of uh, Durango the next day, uh, they would run uh, sometimes just engine and caboose, or as we saw earlier, engine and a few cars down to Carbon Junction and pick up the rest of their train. And they did an interesting move there to expedite their switching. They'd actually perform a flying drop where they cut off the caboose, run ahead with the locomotive, and then. Let the caboose uh, roll on to the to the rear of the train, so they could uh, put everything together and get out of there a little bit uh, faster. And this is a great John Gruber photograph showing that um, we didn't use this one in the book, but we did use a color view by Tom Gildersleeve of, of the same thing in process. Kind of a, a strange thing to see the engine and caboose rolling separately, but together along the track as they they did this really quite a long flying drop to to you know help out their switching. Another great color a view with uh, by Tom Gildersleeve with a fall color out along the Farmington branch. Uh, this is a little wooden trestle near uh, Grubbs, Colorado in October of 1960 with a train heading to Farmington. A signature structure on that line was the, the bridge over the Animas River at Bondad uh, that Victor Hand photographed here in October of 1965. 
and then out in Farmington itself, this is a, a John Huber photograph of a train arrived there and a cruise winding the engine and uh, kind of in the middle of their switching chores. Right. Um, so we follow the train mainly out of the branch to Farmington. I think often the return trip would happen after dark, depending on how much work they had to do. Uh, we do have, I think, a couple of shots in the book, including a Victor Hand night shot uh, of a train coming back. Um, but then once everything was back in Durango after the Farmington turn, um, often it would be, so this would be a three-day cycle now with uh, the first day of train coming west out of Alamosa to Chama, then Chama to Durango, and then uh, Durango to Farmington and back. And after that all happened, it might sometimes be uh, just a few days in the early 1960s until by the end of the 1960s, it could be several weeks before another narrow gauge freight cycle ran. Uh, but whenever that happened, uh, usually a double header would be called out of Durango to, to head uh, east. And there was a pretty steep grade of about 2% uh, for the first seven and a half miles out of Durango. And so they usually have a help with for that. Uh, and this is just a, a wonderful Jim Shaughnessy photograph uh, passing the smelter there, the outskirts of Durango uh, with this train uh, heading east in September of 1959. And of course, as a, a dog person myself, I love that little black dog down there in the in the, uh, <laughs> the middle of, uh, at the bottom of the frame. He's got a great view. He does, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> uh, then another color Victor hand photograph of a, a train steaming east. Uh, this is at Oxford, Colorado in August, uh, October of 1965. Uh, this was ostensibly a freight train. You can see several lumber loads up in the mill in Durango behind the, the locomotive. But and then there's also a, quite a few uh, coaches on the rear. I think this was uh, equipment for an excursion or deadheading east on this train. Uh, and again, this is the you know, stretch between Durango and Chama that's abandoned and included the spectacular uh, three-span bridge over the uh, San Juan River, three miles east of Gato, uh, formerly Pagosa Junction, where the branch to Pagosa Spring split off. Uh, this is uh, August 1967 view of a freight train steaming east here by Carl Zimmerman, uh, taking mostly uh, empty pipe cars east back to, back to Alamosa for another load of pipe for the oil and gas fields in Farmington. And then at the end of this day of operations, this train would arrive in Chama, where it would meet a counterpart coming uh, west out of Alamosa, uh, and everything would tie up there for the night. Uh, and then the next day, they'd get ready for what was really the probably the most exciting uh, part of the narrow gauge. And so, so we spend a little bit of time uh, exploring Chama, and it gets its own chapter in the book, uh, still an evocative place today as part of the Cambridge and Toltec. Uh, John Gruber, again, with his signature photojournalism, gets the railroaders in action, uh, passing hand signals here as they're, they're switching uh, some, some cars out, I think, by the pull dock before leaving that morning. Um, and, you know, this aspect of traditional railroading, like hand signals and brake clubs and retaining valves, all of this stuff from the steam era, beyond the locomotives themselves, but very much a part of that tradition of railroading was, was something that these photographers captured really well. And, we wanted to showcase that in the book too. And then just a wonderful Victor Hand night photograph of the 484 and the 487 simmering an October night away in 1965. Uh, the next day they would take uh, two Cumbria's turns up to the path up to the summit of the pass. Um, and then they make a final run up the hill uh, the following day, taking a total of three cuts up that big four percent grade, which was not unusual at the time if the traffic warranted. And so this is the big, you know, climax of the book that we're really building to these these uh, you know, engine and helper uh, jobs going up to, to Cumbres on that four percent grade. And this is a, a John Gruber photograph from August of 1963, uh, swinging around one of the the many big curves as uh, <clears throat> two engines push and pull. Uh, I think that that day's first Cumbres turn uh, up to the up to the top of the pass. And then I think this is another of those photographs we were kind of kicking ourselves for. Why, why didn't we use this one in the book? Uh, yeah, still, well, this is an outtake. Yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> you can all I throw mean, tomatoes at us now. The idea of showing you these great outtakes is that we hope that the photographs that actually made it into the book are, are even at least as good, if not better than these. And so we yeah. hope by showing you some good outtakes, you you might be even more inclined to to purchase the book and see what's there. Uh, but this, this one certainly, uh, certainly deserved a place. A uh, great Jim Shaughnessy view of a uh, yeah. Uh, Kumbre's turn uh, near Lobato with this cattle out grazing on the hillsides, just just so emblematic of the West and the, the Gramps tank cars that were 
you know, really one of the main uh, sources of traffic on the narrow gauge until the refinery burned in Alamosa. And I think uh, I think that was 1964. Um, right. And uh, you know, then the the signature structure on that part of the railroad was the Lobato trestle. And here we have a great Carl Zimmerman photograph of a train heading across it. Uh, Carl said that the stock cars here would all have been empty. Uh, this is in August of 1967, and livestock shipments had ended the year before. Uh, Carl suspects these were all cars that were heading uh, empty back to Alamosa for scrapping, right. but still look great on a train here. And then uh, just a, 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 one of my many favorite Uber shots, I and mean, you know John for his, his great um, people and railroad photographs, which you know, he certainly... Uh, had few peers at that, uh, but he was equally adept at landscape views. And I love this going away shot of uh, the day's first Cumbres turn approaching Cresco on August of 1963, a day they ran two Cumbres turns. What a sight that would have been as those big clouds boiled over the over the mountains. Yeah, the sense of scale is just enormous here. Oh, yeah, that's a yeah. fantastic view. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then some more color by Tom Gildersleeve of another Cumbrous turn winding up along Windy Point near the summit. Uh, 11 gra loaded Gramps tank cars, absolute maximum tonnage for a pair of 282s on the 4% grade. That's the uh, K36-483 and K37-497, uh, uh, getting those 11 cars off the grade in October of 1962. Right. And of course, up above 10,000 feet, snow can come early. And uh, Jim Shaughnessy found that out in this September visit from 1959 when he encountered a bit of a snow squall there at Cumbres Pass uh, after one of the trains he chased up arrived. I think everyone made it safely down, though. <laughs> Jim certainly lived to tell the tale, at least. <laughs> <laughs> And then a fantastic view by Scott Walmer of a, a helper engine caboose heading back to, to Chama from the summit there at King Braces. Another day ends in the, the high country of the San Juan Mountains. That's the 486 uh, heading downgrade with its caboose to go back and spend the night and probably make another trip up the next day. Mm -hmm. And so after the climax of the assault on the big climb up to Cumbres, then the we conclude the, the main uh, body of the book with with the denouement that always follows the climax, and that's that downhill run from the summit back to Alamosa, uh, typically carried out on the third and final day of, of any freight train cycle. And this is a John Gruber photograph at Los Pinos in August of 1963. Uh, uh, two cuts of this train have been put together at Cumbres, and they're now heading, uh, the, the whole train heading down uh, towards Los Pinos. The helper engine would run light by itself all the way back to Alamosa and then the second engine would follow with the train a little bit later. And this is that same train sweeping around the big horseshoe at, at Los Pinos in August of 1963. Couldn't have timed or or had the most perfect train length possible to make this yeah. happen. And I think this is that spot where Dave uh, Schaff was mentioning earlier that vacation homes yes. have been sprouting like mushrooms on the on the distant hillside. Mm. That's that's tough to hear that, but I mean that is progress. That Thank is goodness progress. we have all these. The, yeah. We have these images to remind us of when it was wide open and remote. And another thing that was interesting to, for me to learn about the final years of the narrow gauge is that you know the Rio Grande was uh, really trying to spend as little money as possible, and so they very rarely bothered to call a dedicated work train. So if there was maintenance of way to be performed, well, the regular road freights had to do that job, and so. Here the train, John Gruber was riding back uh, east to Alamosa in August of 1967, uh, stopped at Los Pinos to dump three loads of ballast. Um, they used uh, scoria, volcanic rock, for their ballast, for something they could obtain locally and cheaply. And the section gang actually came out on their speeder to meet the train and handle the ballast dumping. Uh, the section gang was primarily Hispanic, uh, and I, I think John even tried to track some of them down uh, 50 years later and, and to do interviews about them. but. One of the, the firemen from the train that he rode on uh, in a later interview, John was able to get in touch with Gail Cunningham and Gail related how one of his good friends was of Spanish ancestry and, and Gail was telling him how great it was to work for the railroad, but that the railroad wouldn't hire him for train service. Um, they could only hire him to work in the section gang since he wasn't white. And that was I think something Gail was was you know kind of embarrassed about, but you know, he said his friend understood that was just the way it was then. Uh, but John really captured this this aspect of, of the operation really well. Um, you know, one of the few times I've seen photographs of, of maintenance work being performed like this on the narrow gauge. 
Yeah, I saw one of our chat, Scott, caught the uh, the little uh, stenciling below the Rio Grande lettering where it says rebuilt March of 24. Which would have been, what, 40, 43 40, years, 40 43 years. years before this picture was taken. Mm -hmm. Yeah, every, every 43 years, whether it needs it or not. <laughs> exactly. Uh, good, great catch, and uh, just yeah, wonderful detail. That was a great that catch. <laughs> and then here's a, a really, actually, a healthy looking freight train arriving back, uh, approaching Alamosa in August of 1964, when business was still a bit brisker. We've got some some lumber, probably from Durango, on the head end, and then a number of, of oil cars arriving from Chama, and some box cars on the rear. Uh, probably some of those were empty, uh, empty cars that would have taken drilling right out to Farmington, but. Also, possibly some more loads of lumber back there too. So, you know, yeah. business was still reasonably brisk in, in 1964 to have so much revenue freight coming in on an eastward train in the Alamosa. That's a Don Huff summer photograph from that summer he and, and Sandy spent there. And that essay about uh, that time is, is really delightful and it's certainly a great addition to the book. Yeah, it's as much artistry as the images are. Oh, yeah. You know, it, it just gives you that feeling that. You know, it just can't be conveyed in pictures of what it was like to experience all of that. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And then here the, the trains arrived and, and the one crew's putting their engine away. The, the caboose, uh, the conductor and rear brakeman crew, they've already gotten off and they're walking with their grips back to the depot to mark off after their run that John Greber wrote in August of 1967. And I think I looked it up and I think it was uh, 12 days before another narrow gauge train left from Alamosa that year. <laughs> I mean, just think of, you know, we complain about railroads these days that only run three days a week or something, and that's difficult to, to chase. But my goodness, mm -hmm. you know, you could, as Carl Zimmerman did, you could spend three weeks on the mirror gauge and not see a wheel turn, at least in freight service back then. Yeah, I really can't yeah. complain about being next to the coastline after that. <laughs> right. It certainly puts that in perspective. <laughs> So after following a freight tr uh, train all the way to Farmington and back, we then uh, do a side trip uh, on the Silverton branch. Um, that was a, kind of a separate operation, but very much a part of the narrow gauge. Uh, and this is a great uh, color Victor Hand photograph of the 476 taking a train to Silverton in uh, June of 1960 with those still partially snow-capped mountains in the background along the Animus River. Right. And then uh, John Gruber got this great street scene of a train just arrived at Silverton. Uh, and you know, this was the transition that was happening. I mean, the, yeah. the Rio Grande had wanted to get rid of this line, but the, the tourism uh, boom and the Hollywood boom kind of had other ideas. And, and so right. thanks to that, we've got the Durango and Silverton narrow gauge railroad today. Uh, and this was really the time that that was all changing. Uh, I think on this day, this was a Sunday in August of 1963. And, I, I believe uh, there were two trains actually that day that came up from Durango. It was the, the Rio Grande that recently invested in some additional equipment so they'd be able to run uh, two Silverton trains on busy days. Of course, I think there's there's three running uh, daily right now on the fall season out there, uh, which is uh, all steam powered right now, which would sure be fun to see. Uh, but again, John really captures the the spirit of the moment and the energy of the crowd and and that tourist transition that was sweeping through Silverton at the time. Yeah. And then I'll, I thought I'd let you say a few words about our, our contemporary gallery that, that closes things off. Right, right. Well, uh, it's that was quite a, an experience in itself. I mean, as I mentioned earlier, we were we we realized that we couldn't tell a complete story without showing what what life is like today for the the you know, the successors to the Rio Grande, uh, the Cumbers and Toltec, and the Durango and Silverton, and so. Uh, it turned out that we thought, well, this is a chapter, this won't be too difficult, but I, we made a very small call for photos to a small little group of people and uh, uh, photographers that we knew would have certain images that we were hunting for. And and some of the, um, I think some of the needs that we outlined early on were that, you know, nowadays with, with the um, rail fan freights and charter specials, you know, you can get but people are getting photos in places that used to be just impossible to reach. I mean, just incredibly remote, difficult places. And, you know, now photo freights are stopping in these places and unloading people to, you know, get these great photos that, you know, were just incredibly difficult for folks that were chasing the Rio in, in the Rio Grande era. Um, so we were looking for that. We were looking to show how the track is so much better now. And you can see in this image, uh, this is by William Deal. 
uh, you could see how the, uh, I mean, there's ballast, there's, uh, you know, freshly <laughs> manicured tracks. I mean, there's You can ties. actually see the ties. <laughs> yeah, you could see the ties. So, yeah, these are, these are some of the images we were looking for. And then, of course, we had a few locations uh, that we were interested in getting photos for. But uh, so with all those tiny little, you know, those tight parameters, um, we still were just overwhelmed with, with from the seven or eight people that we reached out to, they just blew us away with images that were just, just mind blowing. Um, and of course we could only use two or three of each, if that. And so, uh, we, that, that last chapter is quite a, a blowout and tonally it's a different change of course, because you're yeah. seeing so much color, but, um, you're also getting a sense of what it's like today with, with, you know, the mainstream uh, tourism public that are now experiencing these trains that, you know, once were just the haunts of five or six, you know, intrepid photographers, or, or obviously more than that, but a very relatively small group of people that, was, that, were, that were making adventures to get to these places. And that was really a story we wanted to tell. It's just the, the, the human interaction with the general public and, and these railroads now, uh, you right. know, is this, this great picture by Anthony D'Amato out on the high line of the Durango and Silverton shows uh, on the uh, observation uh, parlor car of this train heading to right. Silverton on a, a beautiful, uh, beautiful snow-capped uh, wow. sunny day out there in the winter of 2021. Um, you know, and just uh, three folks taken in the view from the, from the rear platform really kind of captures the ongoing uh, sort of timeless appeal of the narrow gauge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very much. And then I think we have the image by, yeah, by Bill Bachton. Yeah, speaking of those uh, photography uh, charters and, and specials and photo freights. Mm -hmm. This is a little more old school. Yeah, right. Yeah, this is 80, 80, uh, 81, 81. October 81. 1981. Yeah. It's a blood. And uh, I yeah. think Bill said that they actually, everyone spent the night here, so they'd be in position for, for uh, photographs the, the next morning. Uh, so what an experience that must have been. Yeah, I can't think of a cooler camp out. <laughs> yeah, look at the stunning fall color that year, too. Those, those colors, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, and to your point earlier, Al, I mean, this is uh, one, of picture, one of Bill's pictures. This is October of 87, uh, the westbound train just west of Osher. And one of these places that was, you know, almost impossible to get to. I mean, you'd have to hike there and basically take one photograph that entire day. And there were a few people who did that uh, in, the, mm -hmm. you know, in the freight era. But this right. is now something that, you know, you can, you can take the train there and, and then have the run-bys done. So... You know, mm -hmm. really, in the, in the modern era, in the narrow gauge, um, there's just been some incredible photographs come out from places that were so much more difficult to get to before. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And with that, I think uh, I think we've we've said our piece about about what this <laughs> book is, and uh, we hope you'll all order a copy, or maybe even one or two or three. They make great gifts. Uh, holidays are coming. It's going to be shopping they season are. soon, and it's uh, available on our website and shipping now. <laughs> So that's mm -hmm. my that's my plug, and I'm not even the marketing guy. <laughs> You're doing a fine job. <laughs> wait, wait, that that's the shameless promotion. But you can see, I mean, there's a reason for that shamelessness. It's it's genuine. Um, we I, I can tell you as someone who grew up not knowing that much about the narrow gauge and always feeling that it was a little far away from me. Uh, I took my first ride across the entire Cumbers and Toltec in 2018, and and just a few weeks later, I or, sorry, a few days later, I rode the Durango and Silverton, and I was just blown away. And so to have a chance to, it, it's like then I got it. I got what made everything special. What was so special about these lines, and what it must have been like during that era. And so to have a chance to work with the the images of our of our heroes and our our friends and peers, um, and our colleagues, it's. To, in service of this line and to tell that story photographically, it's just a real honor for us. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and like you, I mean, I, 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 I read the Durango and Silverton for the first time back in 2000, actually a winter trip to Cascade with my grandparents. Um, that was my entire experience with the narrow gauge until uh, 2019. I then finally did the entire Coombers and Toltec. And then uh, just this spring, uh, when we had an event out in Golden, uh, at Golden with the Colorado Railroad Museum, uh, my wife Maureen came out with me for that. And we drove out to Durango and took the train all the way up to Silverton and back. And so I could get in those last few miles. And I think uh, Maureen's listening in tonight. And I think she'd agree that, that we both really enjoyed that trip. It's just a, a fantastic place. And walking around Durango and Silverton and taking in the Victorian charm of those towns is, I mean, that, that appeal uh, runs deep. And, and boy, to, to see it as it was in the 50s and 60s through the 
the eyes of, of these tremendous photographers in our collection is, is just such a privilege and very much a part of our mission at the center to to keep this work alive to you know, give it um, you know, new interpretation showcase it in new ways so hopefully that people can continue to appreciate it from for all time right right and i see in the chat mark jones just asked a question that we marketers love to answer when will the book be shipped well my <laughs> friend it is shipping now Yes, it is. <laughs> it is on the way. You can get it now and have it in a matter of days, and uh, it can be your very own copy. And if you uh, have, if you have really pre-ordered a copy, if you've pre-ordered a copy and haven't received it yet, uh, please drop us a line. We can yes. certainly check with our distributor to to make sure that everything is getting out there and on its way to you, because we are eager to get this into your hands. We sure are, and I know a few people got theirs early, so. That was a, a special benefit, I guess, of ordering from us directly, but we're glad you did, and we're hoping you're, we hope you're enjoying it. All right, so Haley, I don't know, are there any questions? I see a few things queuing up in the Q&A. I see a few numbers. Sure. Um, are we going to keep, we'll just go ahead and keep this guy up? Uh, yeah, that's, yeah, we can, we'll, we'll, we'll keep the. We'll keep the pitch screen live to okay. until the sales yeah. like it. <laughs> Sounds good. Um, well, uh, probably a good one to start. Uh, we got someone asking how many photographers were included in the publication in total. Do you have kind of a rough? Yeah. So, so in the historic photography, there's eight: um, John Gruber, uh, Jim Shaughnessy, Richard Steinheimer, Victor Hand, Fred Springer, and Tom Gildersleeve, uh, Carl Zimmerman, and Don Possommer. And then in the contemporary gallery, I think there's what six or seven. Um, I believe there's seven. Yeah, seven. So a total of fifteen photographers uh, represented in the book. Uh, eight in the in the historic imagery from the fifties and sixties, and then seven in the in the more recent gallery of the of the Durango and Silverton and Cambridge and Toltec. Uh, we had a smattering of 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 narrow gauge photographs in a few of our other collections. Um, mm -hmm. You know, but again, just because of the great scope of, of the, the project and, and the depth of our archive, we decided to, to focus on those photographers who had really de dedicated a lot of time to it. Uh, and, mm -hmm. you know, it was a, uh, I, I feel like there's enough variety that you can appreciate people's different styles and yet still some cohesiveness to it to, you know, really come together into something that, you know, while the parts are tremendous, I, I like to think we've created a book here that's maybe even the sum is maybe even a little bit more than, or the whole is more than the sum of the parts. Right, right. I think it's, I was telling Scott, it's kind of like um, me with my movie, my love for movies. It's kind of like having an all-star cast. And uh, I, I thought I'll show you my my issue of Trains arrived <laughs> yesterday. Oh, mine did. Mine came too. <laughs> Oh, and there, there is our ad. Um, yes. You can see we treated the ad like a movie poster. So, and there you are, Tom, because Builders <laughs> alphabetically came first. So you won. <laughs> <laughs> only it's, fair way to do it with so many yeah, grades. <laughs> it, it's the only way to do it with those names. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Excellent. Um, a, a question that kind of uh, maybe pairs off of that a bit. Um, someone asked that, you know, or kind of pointed out that photo technology has obviously changed a lot yeah. over the years. So when looking at so many different styles of photographs that we've used in this book, have you noticed any ways how the, or any, how the narrow, have you noticed how the narrow gauge has like maybe changed and how it's been captured or portrayed um, from those early, you know, black and white negatives up until the digital age? I mean, I think if from my perspective, looking through it, this was something we were really trying to showcase in the contemporary gallery is not only just how the railroad has changed, but how photography of it has changed. Um, we have drones now. I mean, having having a drone someplace like the narrow gauge just kind of seems unfair. I mean, the, the photographs from the ground are spectacular enough that the, now the ability to fly up above it is just on a whole other level. And there's a couple, or at least one really fantastic, Nick, uh, at least two, I think, Nick Diamato uh, drone photographs in it. Uh, that shows some of the new perspectives that you can get from aerial imaging, including one uh, twilight view, I think, uh, or maybe that was one that we used as an outtake. But in any case, there's there's um, you know, just some tremendous drone imagery available now. Uh, and modern digital cameras have such higher sensitivity. There's new opportunities for, for low light and night work, not just you know posed stage locomotives at rest, but actually night action photography. Um, mm -hmm. 
and it's possible now um, so many of the the photo charters on the Cougars and Toltec, they start, you know, when it's still dark out and they'll they'll go out to that uh, first trestle just uh, west of Antonito and be in position for sunrise or moonsets out there right at dawn, um, you know, silhouette images of the trains there, you know, in, in conditions that would have been very challenging for, for color film and particularly in the 1950s and 60s. Um, but I have to say, I mean, the uh, one of the reasons we wanted to share some some color as well as black and white is that they just provide such different ways of looking at the railroad. I mean, the, the color from the 60s really gives you that that sort of vintage look and feel. I mean, you know, I think about like some of the great you know, period TV shows like Mad Men or something, and I feel like some of the, the color imagery really helps us kind of get a real sense for that that era that, you know, images like, like Tom's and Victor's could really help us see. And then you know, the black and white work was I think one you know advantage of black and white is is that it you know it really could handle more challenging lighting conditions than particularly any of the color slide film of the era could and so you know people like John Gruber who were constantly pushing their their equipment could still shoot in near dark conditions and you know get right up close and, and shoot in you know, really high contrast situations but through the dark room bring out very usable images that that really present the railroad in a in a way that that I think has its own great appeal. And I mean, I think some of these, these black and white photographs from the 50s and 60s are every bit as strong and powerful today than anything being created right now. So I think there's just some some, mm -hmm. some really great strengths to the photography that, that I think stands the, the test of time. Yeah, yeah I, I agree. I, I think there's a, they have a character all their own. The, the When you look at the older slide films, there's a richness that, Digital is, as I'll never go back, but I mean, I'm a digital shooter, but I mean, there's a richness and a vibrancy some, in some of these images that I just don't see in digital. And and at the same time, digital has its own world. And like Scott was talking about, some of the lighting conditions that digital can capture. I mean, some of the images we got for that final chapter, I was just astonished at some of the images. I mean, there's that shot of the the caboose, the crew with the, on the Cumbers charter. Uh, you know, at blue hour, it's not even blue hour, the sun is virtually gone. There's virtually no light in the sky. Whatever light was left, you know, it's captured. And there are the lanterns on the caboose, the markers. And and I mean, the scene is just, you'll see it in the book, it's phenomenal. And I remember just kind of, I mean, if it was, if I'd been holding it as a slide, I'd have dropped it. It was just <laughs> so rich and amazing that, you know, so each has its own, its, its own wonderful qualities. Well, and I should mention too that that there was uh, even some new opportunities to reinterpret um, photographs taken from that time. Uh, one of the pictures in the book uh, uh, from Antonito, the reflection shot of the two locomotives reflected in the puddle with the water tower in the background that Steinheimer took. Yeah. Those were actually two separate negatives. Stein didn't have a wide enough lens to get that entire scene, so he shot two images side by side and. Decades later, is now widow Shirley Berman scanned them and stitched them together in Photoshop to create a seamless image between the two. And I know that happened at least one other time. Uh, Frank Barry, who did a wonderful book of his own uh, called The Last Winter on the Narrow Gauge, that came out a couple of years ago, another fantastic Colorado and uh, New Mexico uh, uh, Narrow Gauge book. Um, he had a photograph where he'd hiked into the Toltec Gorge and photographed a train uh, approaching there. I think it was a, a, an eastward train. And he again didn't have a wide enough lens to get the whole sweep of the gorge but he took a series of three shots and went back and scanned them and stitched them together decades later uh, digitally to create an all new image of the scene that really he'd seen then but just wasn't able to get with the equipment that he had but thanks to digital he could go back and create it later and so it's great to to see how some of this new technology can allow us to to see the past maybe in, in different ways than we could capture at the time, but in, in ways that I think some of these really creative photographers were already thinking about, even, even though they knew their equipment couldn't do what they took the shots anyway, and hope that someday they might be able to, to present it as they saw it in their minds then and, and through this technology that now they could. Mm -hmm. Just a, a quick question on the back of that. Um, what, what sort of printing was this uh, book done as dual tone or quad tone? Uh, this is quad tone printing. We used uh, just four color ink throughout. All of the black and whites are prepared as four color uh, uh, cyan, magenta, yellow, and black quad tone images. Um, and that way we didn't have to pick between, we didn't have to you know, physically worry about where color versus black and white images fell uh, within the within the, the book. Uh, we had total flexibility as to whether we had color or black and white on any given page. And running the black and white images as, as quad tones, I mean, modern printers are 
are also accurate if you if you give them you know, good material they'll be able to get you nice neutral gray quad tones that come out of that even if they're playing with four colors and they have a lot more uh, depth of tonality than you can get with just black ink and i think they really can rival the duotones that you that you get with like a black and a gray ink but we've done some of our all black and white books that way but you know this way was it was just easier for us to have everything quad tone so we could put anything we wanted to on any page and the costs were very similar and i think the, the quality is too mm -hmm. so a question from me to you guys i know you you mentioned a few along the way but what were some of the most painful cuts <laughs> Are there any that that really? I mean, there is that one in particular that both of you were kind of groaning over when you got to. Are there any, when the others that mm -hmm. really stand out in your mind? Well, remember John John's pan shot uh, mm -hmm. going across the bridge, Scott. I mean, that mm -hmm. was a shot that got cut, and we had it as a two pager, and we cut it at one point, and then somehow you discovered magically. Thank God. One of us, one of our math was terrible and we got more pages out of it and that we both said we want that Gruber shot back it's got to go back yeah and, thank goodness and I mean that's a photograph that really had to be a two-page spread to to have all the impact that, that's in that yeah. image um and yeah. then also Victor Han's night shot became the end papers right but it, it had been cut also and that was a nighttime pan which you know the story of Victor doing the shot is pretty great but I mean oh yeah yeah that was shot I think that was the time uh, Victor is, but there, well, there's a, I mean, the image you were using on social media, the color image, you can see the, it's a, a pacing shot where Victor and friends were driving alongside the train. I think Don Phillips was actually driving their, their chase vehicle. Right. And uh, you can see the shadow of the car on the road. And what you can actually see is that the trunk of the car is open. And there's a photographer in the trunk of the car riding along as they go pacing the train at 30 miles an hour on US 285. Uh, I'm not sure who was in the trunk and who was in the, uh, in the uh, car itself uh, there were a few of them out there on that trip um for the night I like shot, to think it's victor I, yeah <laughs> I, like I like to think it's victor we should ask him we, we probably uh, should double check that but yeah, i, that I do victor. know i do know from victor that for the night shot uh he was in the back seat of the car uh with his um you know speed graphic out the window uh connected by wire to a flash bulb that a very daring friend of theirs was holding while riding in the trunk and so that it's a it's a night flash shot that's in the end papers, the rear end papers of the book. Just an absolutely stunning image of one of the uh, the K twenty eights racing along. I think that on an excursion on its last miles back to Alamos after an all day run, taken with flash bulbs uh, and and again somebody riding in the trunk of the car. Uh, and uh, um, I, I was thinking today about that, and I I sure hope uh, Victor bought them better at the end at the end of that run. <laughs> Yeah, I, I hope he fed and fed and wined and dined them well. Yes, yeah, exactly. But yeah, that was another one that almost got cut and yeah. then it came back. Thank goodness we well, were you know, able we, to bring it to the end papers. At one point, we thought we might need you know maps in both sets of end papers, but you know Dave just did such a bang up job on the on the map and the front end papers. It really covered everything we wanted, and so that freed up those rear end papers for for something else. And we thought, well, why not another photograph and why not one that should be big? And and uh, that was one we really liked. Right, exactly. Yeah, well, it's funny to think I about think... like that, that Gruber pan shot or pacing shot on the on the bridge that, that you know almost didn't make it. I mean, I can't really imagine the book at this point without that image there. So I can't you know, again, imagine. again, who are we to be doing this? <laughs> yeah, again, we're not worthy. Let's just make that clear. Right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, I, I got a laugh because I see a comment from Neil Lang who wants to ask you, Scott, if that is your drone flying above you in, in your room. In no, your it's, 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 it's just the it's, fan. If, if it was the drone, I don't think anyone would, would be able to hear me. Um, it might be a bit loud. But no, it's it's up in the seventies here in Madison today, even after the sun's gone down, and, and we don't uh, we don't have air conditioning in the home office, so the, the fan helps uh, helps with that. Well, we have a lot of people already asking for a sequel, and I well, I'm not going to go promise anyone that. I do know that we should have a a way for a lot of people to still have access to these photos. So, how much? How many of the collections in this book are available on Odyssey and 
what might it be? I'm not sure if either of you would know, but what might be the best way to help people find those on that platform? Yeah, certainly start searching for, for narrow gauge photographs on Odyssey. We have some there. We have a whole lot more that we still need to add. So so keep checking back because we'll be we'll be populating that with more photographs along the way. Um, but I, I would like to actually address the uh, the matter of a, a second edition uh, of volume two uh, directly. And and you out there can help us get to volume two by helping us very quickly sell out of volume one, because there will certainly not be a volume two as long as there's still a volume one in the warehouse. So um, the quicker uh, you help us sell out of volume one, the sooner we can start thinking about volume two. And for all the people who've gone out and bought their book, where can they hunt you two down to get their copy signed? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I suspect we'll both be at Conversations 2024. Um, that's going to be, we actually haven't announced this the completely yet, but that's going to be in the middle of June next year, and we will be making a public announcement about that very soon. Um, that would be one great opportunity. I'd say there's a pretty good chance we'll both be at Winter Rail uh, in March. So those would be yeah. two uh, two chances to catch uh, uh, Scott and L together in the in the coming uh, months. Um, and uh, if there's other chances, we'll be sure to let you know. If if you want to cover our travel expenses to to come to you and maybe do some photography along the way, we could probably uh, entertain that notion as well. <laughs> we could be talked into that. Yeah, but uh, no, seriously, we really appreciate everyone's interest, yeah. and we thank you all so very much for tuning in and sticking yeah. with us, asking questions and. And um, we really hope you enjoyed the book. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much. Uh, thank you all for joining us and for sticking with us. Most of you did. So we really appreciate it. And yeah, we will find a way to sign books for you if we can. But otherwise, please enjoy them. That's what it's really all about. Yeah. Well, and thank you to both of you for obviously the great work that you've done on this book and for the presentation tonight, I think based on all of the wonderful little emojis I've been seeing floating up in the bottom of the screen, people are really happy with what they've seen. So I'm excited for everyone to get their copies so they can see more and drool over it in the privacy of their own homes. <laughs> well, we look yes. forward to it. And that is, it's it's really just such a privilege and an honor to do what we do. And the, anytime we're able to, to share photographs from our collections and, and present them in, in new ways, I mean, that's just some of my absolute favorite work. And, and I mean, that's when I pinch myself, I actually get paid to do this. So thank you guys so much. Yeah, thank you guys. All right, thank you. And just a reminder, we are recording tonight's program. Um, it'll be available on our YouTube channel at that link at the bottom of our screen, youtube.com slash railphotoart. And we'll be posting this in about two weeks time. Um, oh, and, and what's our what's our next program, Haley? I I would, look forward to our next our program we next month. We're, we're <laughs> going to bring Elrond back up here along with our good friend Ken Rehor to dive a little deeper into Stein's corporate photography. Um, and I'll yeah. let Elrond say more if you have more to say. <laughs> I, I can jump in really quickly. Uh, I tell you, it's going to be a really cool show. Um, we are going through Dick Steinheimer's photography and uh, the the angle that we're taking to this program is how Stein was photographing in Silicon Valley during the time he was making these amazing railroad photographs and kind of establishing his legend. Uh, he was inventing new styles of photographic techniques for all the giant companies of Silicon Valley in the very beginning of the, of the whole uh, computer world uh, coming to life. And um, he's doing, he's like working on the newest industry while he's also photographing the older, the oldest industry. And so that's what our program is going to be about, a really cool comparison of the two styles. And then also how did uh, his Silicon Valley work influence uh, the, the chapter in his life where he began photographing for the railroads commercially. And so that will also be part of the program. And uh, how did he, how did he uh, do his, how did it change his railroad photography once he became, um, you know, a hired gun, so to speak. So uh, yeah, and you know, Ken and I are both Stein devotees, so there will be lots of gushing and great images, and it'll be really fun. I'm really looking forward to that one. And that's November 14th, I believe. Yeah, Tuesday, November 14th. I think it'll be a completely new side to Steinheimer's work that I am looking forward to discovering and, and seeing how you and Ken compare and contrast it to, to some of his great railroad photographs he was making at the same time. I'm sure looking forward to it.